Well, hi everyone. I wanted to do t a quick video today. I know I had originally posted that I would most likely not get a lecture video completed until Friday, but I, I think it's it's necessary to do so today also to help you all kind of take stock of where you are. Uh, I just completed grading the third essays, and I must say that I graded those somewhat leniently because I haven't really been accessible to uh, give you suggestions on those papers as you are were working on them in the same way I had been on previous papers, but I did notice that there were some mistakes that students are still making, that many of you are still making, uh, that are common mistakes, things that should have been uh, addressed in your 101 classes or in your developmental writing classes if you have taken those classes. So I uh, actually went to the internet and I found another resource that I think will help you uh, better understand this and I'm going to attach this to this video. Uh, this is coming from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay so it's a f another four-year institution and it gives you some more information on references for college papers and what references are acceptable. One of the things you need to consider as you are moving forward is certain uh, sites, certain resources are not really acceptable for a college level paper. A lot of these are uh, sources such as your class notes, your textbook, the morning newspaper, uh, out-of-date sources. Uh, these are particularly true when you're dealing with history or the sciences. If a source uh, is presenting viewpoints that are no longer considered accurate, if you cite something uh, that is no longer accurate often, that's just a signal to your professor or instructor that you have not done uh, quality research, that it was thrown to together really quickly. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> the, these two are, are really, really important to think about, but there's even more uh, sources that are truly not acceptable, and these are things like your encyclopedias and dictionaries for most research. Encyclopedias and dictionaries are not acceptable because uh, as they say here, for the most part, they are not original sources. Uh, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not information that is representing uh, original research. Now, he also puts the Internet on here in radio and TV broadcasts, uh, popular look, books, popular magazines, and newspapers. I wouldn't go so far as to leave those out. Uh, I would say that those are least, they're not as quality uh, research as scholarly art articles, but encyclopedias and dictionaries really don't look uh, to be good sources uh, because of their lack of originality and also because they just give you a sort of overview of the information. They don't really go into depth. Uh, one of the things you have to remember is they're geared toward giving people quick information. And because they're geared toward quick information, that information isn't always quality information. It doesn't always have depth. Another thing to think about is your audience. You're writing for a college-educated audience, a general audience uh, that is intelligent. And if you define a term for uh, them using a dictionary, or if you use an encyclopedia explanation of a concept, in a lot of ways you're offending their intelligence. Uh, they would already understand that term. There are terms that do need to be defined, but they should not be defined using dictionaries. They should be defined in the context of the discussion. So the, this is a uh, something you need to really keep in mind uh, because I keep seeing encyclopedia citations and dictionary citations in your research and uh, I should not be seeing those anymore. So in your fourth essay there definitely should not be any citations coming from textbooks, lecture notes, that means uh, unless I specifically state 
that you can use some information from the world of the image, uh, you shouldn't actually even be citing that. Uh, you should be using research from articles, uh, from the scholarly databases, things like Academic Search Complete or EBSCOhost. Uh, you should be looking at uh, scholarly books. Uh, that sort of research. Uh, now you can again use information from popular books, popular magazines, newspapers, radio, and TV broadcasts. This uh, handout says that they are not acceptable references. Uh, I would say that they're not as good a quality uh, source for this sort of thing. And I like I like his comment here, but won't that take a lot of time? Well, yes. That's why you start work on research papers as soon as they are assigned. So you should uh, work on your research as soon as assigned. Another thing is I have seen Wikipedia used a couple of times. Uh, I, I have this sort of ambivalent feeling about Wikipedia. Uh, basically, Wikipedia is... Uh, a dangerous site. What I mean by that is because anybody uh, can go in and edit it, then it's likely that some of the information would be inaccurate. So you use Wikipedia as a starting off point for your research uh, instead of as an actual reliable source. Now, what you need to use for reliable sources are uh, information that is gotten from the MacNeese Library, the Fraser Library. So, you have the online databases, and of course you have to have the login to access these, which I don't have here, but you see Academic Search Complete and then you would use the login to the licensed databases. Actually, my login might work now here on this pen. Now, let me see where what it says for my pen. And I think we un dealt with this in one of my earlier videos that I didn't actually have my pen at that time uh, because it's a separate login. But you should have that information. And if you're on campus, you can actually log in without this information. You don't have to use your pen to get these articles. And your articles should look something. We have Academic Search Complete at uh, on our library at Lamar, and it looks exactly the same. I, I've used the MacNeese version numerous times as well, uh, and it looks exactly the same as ours. Uh, you go in and you select full text and scholarly typically references available an article and you need to play with this a little bit to check your different searches but that's the sort of place you go for your database articles to make sure they're useful database articles and that's where the bulk of your research should come from now there's another uh, source that you can use one I like to use uh, called the uh, crap test and I'm actually going to add uh, that here let me see if they have it in our lib guides for you so I can add our rubric that we used and you I'm pretty sure that your library has a uh, version of it here you go and they actually our library created a, uh, a rubric that can be used and I will save this for you all when you are and attach it to this video as well so when you are looking at websites you can actually test it to make sure that it's useful now another thing I've noticed too is a lot of you are kind of uh, not really citing websites correctly whether you're using APA or MLA so in order to cite a website using MLA, I'm going to show you Al at Purdue again. Uh, I've shown you this a couple times. Uh, and if you just look at the MLA version of it, you can go down here to Electronic Sources. And it gives you a bunch of different information on citing an entire website. 
but most of the time you would actually cite a web page, for example, and you would have something like this. Now, occasionally you would have ND if there's not a date, but almost always there's a date. You would just have to look for it. You have the uh, page's title, you have the website's title, you have the publisher, you have the date of publication, you have the word web, and then you have uh, the date you've accessed it. So if I looked at something like, uh, if you recall in my last video on the Batman symbol, and I want it to go to, let's say, uh, I'm going to search through these to see if I can find something that's not Pinterest or Wikipedia or anything along those lines. Here's something from it looks like Time Magazine. And uh, yeah, this is uh, Time Magazine where it's sort of a GIF where they go to, through all the different versions of it. So what I would do actually is I would go in and look at this. Um, article and I would title it and I have an author for it so it's Lynn C. Joseph and in my works cited page in MLA the MLA citation for this MLA style version of it looks like this. I'd say Lynn Joseph C. And then I would put the title of the uh, article. Notice when I cut and pasted that it changed the format. You need to go back in and change the format back to a standard format. Notice that I have to go in and actually uh, take out some standard formatting that occurs when I do the cut and paste. Now this is Time Magazine, so this is an article on their web page. So I would have to go in and put in Time in italics. And then I would have to put the publisher uh, not in italics. This says WebMD for their example. This is Time Inc. Network. And then I would need the date of posting, if I remember correctly. Yep, date of posting. And so that image that GIF is uh, posted on the 28th of March, 2014. And then it's on the web, obviously. And then I went to it on the 13th of April, 2016. And of course, I would use hanging indents because we use hanging indents with all citation styles. Now, for MLA, it's alphabetical, not numbered, and I would use the term works cited or works cited if there's only one. Now, for APA, I would use the term references and then I would go in and I would need to go back up to here, Al at Purdue, right? Go back to research and citation. If I didn't know what I was doing, I could go to APA, uh, drop this down, and I want to look for reference list electronic sources where 
those electronic sources. And then I'm going to get an uh, online scholarly article from an online periodical with neat no DOA abstract, electronic books, Kindle books, online book reviews. I need to try to find exactly what I'm going to cite. And notice that there's nothing for a standard web page, really, because web pages aren't really something that you're supposed to be citing in academic research. Uh, but what I am going to do is find something close to it, like a newspaper article and I'm going to adapt it. So in this case it says author AA year month day. So in this case I would say Lynn Joseph C and then I would want to put the date and it said uh, to put the uh, year and then month and day. So you put the year first 2014 March 28. And then I would have to go in and put the title of the article. And the title of the article, this is a not a newspaper, it's a magazine. So I would keep all of this. Part would stay the same. And then I would put retrieved from and the URL. retrieved from and so that's how you cite a web page if you are citing uh, a research article so if you're citing an article from a scholarly database you would go You can go to Al at Purdue or your handbook uh, and do as follows. Works cited. We will look up the article here and I am going to use my database again. Uh, since I don't have my login for your database, I'm going to type in the word Batman. Batman in the Trash, Canon Construction and Bibliography. This will be an interesting article. I'm going to pick a PDF version of it. English Language Notes, October 1st, 2008. William Kuskin, Batman in the Trash. All right, so what I'm going to do now is for the MLA version, of course, I'm going to go in and put Kuskin, William, period. And then I put the title of the article, uh, Batman in the Trash, Canon Construction and Bibliography. Period. And then I need the article title, or the journal title, which in this case is English Language Notes. Notice it's over here. Uh, but sometimes I can find it in the actual journal title here, English Language Notes. And then I can also go here, and let's say I don't remember what else I want to do. Go back to Research and Citation, MLA, MLA Formatting and Style Guide, and I'm going to pick Electronic Source. I'm going to scroll down until I find an article from a scholarly database or something like that, an article in an online scholarly journal from an online database or a subscription service, and that is right here. 
as you see. Uh, so I have the article title. I have the journal title. Now I need the volume and issue number. Uh, and that is right here, 46.2. Notice I don't put the words volume or the words issue. I just put the numbers. <clears throat> and then I need the information. Let's see. I need the year of publication. And this goes in parentheses. So I would look for the year of publication in the article 2008 and then I would look for the page numbers now since this is uh, a PDF it has page numbers if it was an HTML I wouldn't need to put page numbers I need to correct my punctuation here And uh, the page numbers are, there's 14 pages and it starts on 57, so I can do some quick math there, Six, uh, 72, 57 to 71, uh, 57 to 71, make sure that's right, 57 to 71. And then I would look for, then I picked the database, web, and the date of access, or the, um, yeah, date of access. So the database here is Academic Search Complete. And the web is how it was accessed, and the date of access, again, is the date of this video. And then I have that citation. Now the APA version of that is going to again be references. And we go back to our and you can go to research and citation, APA style, formatting, electronic sources. And we're going to scroll down from online scholarly journal article uh, from with DOI. If it has a DOI, we have to put that. This is DOI, those numbers. Uh, if it doesn't, then we... Uh, don't put that, but we put the URL, but this is a database. Now it says here, APA states that including database information and citations is not necessary because databases change over time. However, the AL still includes information about databases for those users who need database information. Uh, when referencing a print article obtained from an online database, such as a database in the library, provide appropriate print citation Format it just like a normal print citation. By providing this information, you allow people to retrieve the print version if they do not have access. So what you see here, right, is the general information you need for this citation and where it's retrieved from. So in this case, we would want the uh, DOI. So, let's see if this has a DOI. Does this article have a DOI? I'm not seeing it, but you know, one of the things you can do, and I'm, I'm, I'm certain that the McNeese version of this has this option. You can go to this little site icon here. You can look up the APA citation and you can check it see here and notice that this one we don't have the name spelled out there's no DOI listed so we can go in and we can actually look at that now I would not 
cut and paste it because when you cut and paste it, uh, what happens is it changes the color of it. I forgot about this, that they don't require the quotes in APA. They actually have 57 through 69, so we need to change this. And they don't actually put in the retrieved from here, which I think is interesting, I guess because it has a print equivalent. So this would be enough information to find its print version uh, if the if the library carried it. So from what you see there, these are the two primary ways of citing either MLA or APA and the two primary types of sources you should be doing uh, using for research. Now remember any sort of web page, web article needs to come from a reliable source, from a reliable source. As it says here, reputable News media, Time, Newsweek, New York Times, serious popular magazines, government publications, and internet versions of these sources. Uh, otherwise, they need to come from databases. Your research needs to come from databases. Now, your textbook is, in this instance, at times a reliable source, but I want you to be clear in understanding that in future classes, when you are citing uh, for a paper, you don't want to just reiterate information that's in your textbook necessarily unless the teacher is using it as a way for you to practice citations. Now, uh, that's some general ideas on how to cite uh, references. Again, I am going to try to save these things for you and upload them to uh, this video so you have access to them. Uh, it's a little tricky on how much it'll allow me to actually upload. As you know, Moodle's a little more picky than, uh, <laughs> than some other uh, learning software, learning management systems. So I can't always upload everything I would like to upload for you. I might have to pick multiple posts to do that. Uh, so a couple other things I want to go over for you. First, uh, let's look at the fourth unit, which you should be starting now. It has a Moodle book again. Follow the Moodle book very closely. Uh, it talks a bit about revision. There's a prompt sheet here for you to look at. Please read the prompt sheet. It wasn't clear to me that all of you had read the prompt sheet for the last essay based on some of the things you had written. As I said, I graded leniently, but some of you had written about individuals as symbols uh, and how they had transcended into icons, but you hadn't really made it clear how they had become images, you know. Uh, so there's a bit of that going on. So in this fourth essay prompt, for the final essay, you will think about the application of visual literacy and understanding how images are manipulated to communicate specific ideas. Consider a particular current event or conflict in which images are playing a major role in communicating complex ideas, often simplifying complex ideas in ways a soundbite cannot. Elections use images, and I want you to think about things like those graphics that are used by the different campaigns. Perhaps you could write a paper about that, sort of like Ted Cruz's Trust Ted or uh, 
Donald Trump's Make America Great Again, that phrase over a red background, which is an interesting thing to think about. Uh, Bernie Sanders, Feel the Burn, um, Hillary Clinton's H with the arrow pointing uh, to the right or the left. I don't recall which way it points. Are the, the bird that's suddenly become an image in, in recent uh recent weeks for Bernie Sanders versus the donkey and the elephant, uh, how terrorism uses imagery, how militaries use imagery. Militaries use imagery quite effectively. A lot of the, uh, you know, uh, the bars that show rank, the, uh, the shields have different images on it to show whether you're cavalry or, uh, you know, the, the different subgroups within the military and corporations do a lot too with like Google you know McDonald's uh, there was a paper about Mitsubishi's uh, emblem uh, in the last papers uh, that sort of thing uh, people are hired who use images to manipulate different publics and some of you touched on that idea in this last paper so if you think about that with this paper it's drawing in that sort of concept that different audiences look at images in different ways. Uh, and I want you to analyze that process in your paper. Show me that you've thought about this process. So as always, this uh, the conversation will begin with your reader. In this instance, the world of the image, chapter 4 and 5, will be where you begin. Use the insights in these articles to help you develop these concepts. Now that does not mean quoting these articles. What it means is reading about uh, these concepts and thinking about the different ways images are used. You know, uh, there's a great thing about, once again, patriotic themes ring true as an article and dealing with images of patriotic art. Uh, there's a dire image, the art of persuasion, how uh, the article Cartoon War Wars by Richard Goldstein, which deals with uh, cartoons, the image of reality and how we often confuse reality and images, and this creates a major conflict uh, in our minds because the image doesn't always match up with the reality. Uh, I, I think about images of warfare, for example, uh, and how in a lot of films we, we have war is shown in this very glorious light. But then if you talk to many soldiers who come back from war, they'll tell you that there is nothing glorious in war. So that sort of thing uh, needs to be thought about as you are reading. And these articles are jumping off points for your own thinking. They might inspire you to go and research a certain topic or idea or issue more clearly. Uh, and you've already done a bit of that with your proposals early in the semester. In some ways, this could be a further extension and revision of previous papers. So you don't need to throw out information. If you wrote a really quality uh, paper for your third essay, uh, you may want to go and look at that even more and really expand and, and approach that in a completely new way. Uh, and the same thing could be true for paper two as well. So I want you to choose a single image to analyze, not multiple images, a single image. Then you will explore that image's development over time and how it is used in our society. Uh, so, you know, when I talk about a single image, I might talk about a photograph. Or I might talk about, you know, an uh, image like uh, the monk that sets himself on fire. Uh, during the Vietnam War that was on television and how that became the cover of a Rage Against the Machine album, um, you know, that sort of thing. Or you can think about the image of the American flag, for example, and how that's changed and uh, been adapted over time from a point of being held in very high reverence to now where it can be, you know, on people's bathing suits and nobody blinks an eye. Now, this paper requires 10 sources, so this is quite a long paper. Those sources need to be cited both in the body of the essay and using in-text citation and using a works cited page. The sources need to be either secondary sources, seven of those, are and three primary sources. And you can use a creative source, which means 
if the image is a piece of art, for example, you can cite that piece of art. Uh, and that actually might help you uh, to think of this. You know, there's one piece of uh, photography that I've used uh, for the writing of poems and the writing of papers before. Uh, and that's a picture that looks like an eye. And it's actually, I think, it's the Crab Nebula. And it was taken by the Hubble telescope. And then I've used that as an image in, in different writings. And it's an image that's reused often. Uh, it looks like this. If you want to do a quick uh, search for it. Sometimes it's called the Eye of God. This nebula here. And you can see different versions of it. And it's used... different pictures and it, and it is this it's the same nebula uh, but people see it different ways right in, in the art so you have different graphics of it so people use this in different ways and it's developed over time to mean different ideas it's the helix nebula actually the helix nebula uh, and, and the reason it looks like this is because the lighting that's filtered through the telescope when it takes pictures, as you can see in, in other different lighting, lighting structures, it looks differently uh, than that. So uh, that is the gist of the paper. You need to pick one creative source, a piece of art. You need to have three primary sources, one of which is your creative source. You need to have seven secondary sources. That means that come from journals or magazines, like I showed you how to cite in the beginning of this lecture video. And three of those must be from academic journals. Uh, it should be eight to ten typed pages, approximately 2,000 words. Uh, time point, uh, Times New Roman font, 12-point MLA format. So we are back on MLA format. Now, you may also revise this into APA format and submit it for extra credit. So let me show you that real quick. You see here you have the APA version and that is an extra credit. So you would write it in the MLA format and then you would reformat the citations for APA format to make some extra points as well. Now you also have a discussion board here. How will you adjust your research to meet the needs of the last paper? What new resources can you bring to this essay? Answer these questions and express other ideas about this process in this forum. So it's very important in order to write in this forum to get the points for participation in this forum that you discuss your process. Actually talk about the articles that you are identifying. Talk about the questions you have. And I will try to be checking this a little more uh, frequently than I have uh, the forum for the third essay uh, now that... Uh, I am no longer uh, in surgery and that sort of thing. So, uh, again, if you have any questions about this process, please email me. Please spend some time uh, really vetting your sources. The sources are going to be an extremely important part of this paper. Remember, this is quite a long paper. Now, the next thing you may notice is that the final exam module is open for you and then this describes all the stuff uh, related to the end of the semester, how to figure out your grades based on the information I gave you, uh, how, to, how you will pass the class, how I cannot release final grades via email, and how actually the final grades as they appear here uh, are not the final grade. Uh, that there's a, a different sort of calculation that the department requires me to do than Moodle will have me do. And this is something I talked about at the beginning of the semester. And all that data is here for you, how to do that. You see that you have a re portfolio review questionnaire that you can submit. And that's here. And it's based on the questions that are in the 
CRG. You would type those out and submit them there. And uh, that is required. It's part of your participation, even if you don't want to use the portfolio as something to uh, help you get a, a better grade. Now, the portfolio review process is something that uh, I've mentioned to some of you. If you are hovering around a D or an F and you have turned in all your papers, the portfolio review is one option you have for possibly getting a C. It will be reviewed by me and then reviewed by another faculty member uh, on the English faculty. And there is a chart and a rubric that we have to go through to look at your portfolio, which is all your papers, and to make sure that uh, you know you've put in the work and you've met the requirements of thirteen uh, of one hundred two uh, in order to receive that C. You see here that the grammar and mechanics skill diagnostic is uh, here again. Uh, it's worth 5% of your final grade. And then there will be uh, a final exam link in there. This is not the only information you have for the final exam. You will have to still write an essay, but I do not receive that prompt sheet until uh, exam week. It's given to me by the director of freshman and sophomore English online, and then I have to set it up and set up the time for you so you can see what um, before I can make it accessible for you and you'll get more information on that as we get closer to it. So that's pretty much it for the next couple weeks really focusing on this uh, final paper in Unit 4 uh, and thinking about how revision works going through that process, discussing it, being sure that you're very much involved in the discussion forums um, I will be posting some grades for you all through messaging uh, related to your participation uh, as the week progresses. That will probably be on Friday as well. And uh, if I think of anything, like I'm getting a lot of questions on the discussion board, or somebody emails me a question that I think uh, will be good to do a, like a lecture video on for you, uh, then I'll do another lecture video. Uh, again, if you have any questions, message me, email me, uh, post it on the Q&A, and I will get back in touch with you ASAP. Uh, I hope the video finds you well.